Hello, everybody. Uh, today we are looking at John 15 for our Great Ones Bible study. Uh, we're actually going to be just looking at the first eight verses. If you would like to go ahead and turn there now. Uh, we're going to be talking about what it means to be connected to Jesus as we look uh, at these passages. As we're reminded often, we always need to look at the context. So what was going on in John 15 when Jesus is speaking these words? So this is the last of Jesus's I am statements in the Gospel of John. Pastor Don uh, mentioned this last week as he was covering um, John 10. So I am the door and I am the good shepherd we talked about last week. Uh, in John 15, we see the seventh I am statement, which is I am the true vine. Just like in each of these other six statements, Jesus is pointing to his deity. I think that uh, studying these seven I am statements would be uh, just a great side study if you're interested. John chapters 14 through 17 is often called the Last Supper Discourse. This was the last time that Jesus is uh, speaking, teaching his disciples. If you really think about it, in just a few hours from now, he's arrested He's tried, he's crucified, he knows the end is near, and yet he wants to prepare his disciples for their time without him as best as he can. Something to think about here is when someone is nearing death, what do, what do they talk about? What are they sharing? What are they saying to the people that are close to them? I would encourage you to think about this, talk about it with your family and your, uh, maybe in your home group as well. Uh, if this was you, what would you be saying to the people around you, the people that are closest to you? I would think that it would be words of great importance. I think that it would be um, what is really closest to your heart, um, the concerns that you have for those people. And that is exactly how we should see Jesus's words in John 15. So Jesus is not introducing a new um, idea here by using the metaphor of the vine in the branches. In the Old Testament, God's vine was Israel. He used them to accomplish his purpose in the world, and he blessed those connected with him. He cared for the vine, he trimmed it, he cut off the branches that didn't bear fruit. But God's vine, Israel, proved to be a fruit, fruitless, unfaithful vine. You can read about this in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. Now there is a new vine. Fruit and blessing come through a connection with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true vine, and only those who are joined to Christ receive their uh, power from him to produce fruit in the Christian life. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here. I uh, first want to give you some framework of what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to talk through the four elements of this passage, which is the vine, the branches, the vine dresser, and the fruit. So first off, the vine. Jesus Christ is the true vine. We see this in verse 1 and in verse 5. The word true is often used to describe what is eternal, heavenly, and divine. The vine is the source and sustenance of life for the branches. The branches must abide to the vine in order to bear fruit. So just to make sure we're all on the same page here, Jesus is the vine, the people are branches. We see a great picture of the close, permanent, vital union between the vine and the branches. If the branches are to live and bear fruit, they must be completely dependent on the vine for nourishment, support, 
strength, and vitality. Many who call themselves Christians fail to depend on Christ. Instead of being attached to the true vine, Jesus, what else do we see people attaching themselves to? This is a really another great discussion topic. I think some attach themselves to their bank account, their profession, popularity, possessions, relationships, could even be their kids or grandkids, fleshly desires. Really, for some, it could even be their church or some religious system. But none of these things can sustain or bear fruit. The true vine is Christ. So moving on to the next element, which is the branches. We've already mentioned that these are people, right? So looking at verse 4, it says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So in case you were wondering, that is four times the word remain is used in this one verse. Do you think that means it's important? We should definitely get the idea here that we must abide or remain in the vine, Jesus, in order to bear fruit. It's important uh, that we look at these words, and I'm, I'm using abide and remain because it really just depends on the version of the Bible that you're using, that both of them are used, but we um, really want to be able to have a clear understanding of what that means and what our role is here. So I would like to share three aspects of uh, these words, abide or remain. So these words imply a connection with Jesus, a dependence on Jesus, and a continuance with Jesus. So first one, connection, having a life-giving connection to him. This is also referred to as union with Christ. This connection or union is mutual. We abide in him, he abides in us. Dependence. Dependence, it, um, this aspect of abiding also implies dependence, but um, this is not recip reciprocal. The branch is dependent on the vine, but the vine is not dependent on the branch. The branch derives its life and power from the vine. The branch is useless, lifeless, and powerless without it. Just as the branch is dependent on the vine, so are we dependent upon Jesus for everything. The second half of verse 5 says, If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. The third um, one here is continuance. Abide means to remain, stay, or continue. To abide is to reside. Pretty catchy. So this other aspect of abiding is remaining in Jesus. We keep trusting. We keep depending. We never stop believing. That sounds a little bit like my favorite journey song. So to sum it all up, to abide in Jesus means to be united to Jesus. That's the connection. To rely on Jesus. That's the dependence. And to remain in Jesus. That's the continuance. You might be thinking, this all sounds great, but how do I abide? Well, I'm going to give you a few things here. And first, and foremost, the most important, right, is believing in Jesus and receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Then from there, we are, we're obeying God. We're doing what he tells us to do. Uh, we're spending time in God's word, in prayer, and in worship. We're confessing our sin and turning away um, from our sin. And we are being in relationship and serving alongside the body of Christ, which is the church. 
So then another good question would probably be, how do I know if I'm abiding? This is really spelled out for us also in John 15. So again, I'm just going to uh, read down through these. So we will produce fruit. That is found in verse 2, right? We're going to talk more about fruit later in our study. Uh, we will experience the Father's pruning. That is also found in verse 2, and we're going to talk more about that as well. We will have prayers answered. We see that in verse 7. We'll see our love for Christ and our love for other believers grow. We see this in verse 9 and in verses 12 and 13. And then we will experience joy. And we see this in verse 11. So let's move on now to the vine dresser. This is the person that is in charge of caring for the vine. And this is the work of our Father God. The disciples were, were familiar with the role of a vine dresser. This person must be carefully trained or they could ruin an entire crop. In fact, they would have like two to three years of training. Uh, they must know where to cut, how much to cut, even what angle to make the cut. They have two duties and we see them both described in verse two. So let's look at that. It starts off by saying, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So he's cutting off the fruitless or dead branches because these would be taking sap away from the fruit bearing branches. As we continue in that verse, it says, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so it can be um, bearing more fruit. So here we see that he trims the shoots from the fruit bearing or living branches so that all of the sap is concentrated in those fruit bearing branches. So thinking about these branches that aren't producing fruit, imagine if you were a vineyard owner or maybe a nursery owner, or maybe you just have some fruit trees in your yard. Whatever the scenario, you go out and you find that some branches are not producing fruit. Hmm. I think one of the first questions you would ask yourself is why? What's going on here, right? Uh, it could be, uh, you would think to yourself, maybe a disease of some sort. Could it be lack of resources such as uh, water, light, nutrients? Could it be from some kind of trauma to the tree? Or maybe it could just be that it's not the right time for this tree to bear fruit. So you can see how any of these factors could also be reasons why people do not bear fruit. It doesn't mean that a person has lost their salvation. It just means that they're unproductive. And after a time, there is discipline that takes place for those who are out of fellowship and who do not bear fruit. Just as an unfruitful branch is useless, so an unfruitful believer is useless and both must be dealt with. It's really a tragic thing for a once fruitful believer to backslide and lose his privilege of fellowship and service. So we see here that John 15, 6 describes to us divine discipline rather than eternal destiny. I don't want to fail to mention the fact that this could be a superficial believer or a religious person. We could look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5, which speaks to this, and I'm going to go ahead and read that. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So a genuine believer attached to the true vine, Jesus, will produce fruit. Which leads us then to those fruitful branches. So I'm going to repeat that statement again because it's important to think about. A true branch united with the true vine, 
will always bear fruit. Now we know that every branch is not going to produce a large crop all the time. Some seasons are going to be better than others, just like in our own lives. But no matter the amount of fruit, pruning is always necessary. The Father tenderly cares for those fruit-bearing branches. He prunes so that more fruit can be produced. So the Father removes sins and other things that limit our fruitfulness, but it's not just that. He also cuts off the stuff that is alive and successful. He must cut away the good and the better so that we can enjoy the best. In chapter 12 of God's Power to Change Your Life, Pastor Rick Warren explains this. He says, I have a neighbor who is an expert rose grower. His front and backyards are beautiful, so I invited him to come over to my backyard and work his magic on my roses. He was a wonder to watch. He brought his loppers to do his pruning, and he was ruthless. It hurt me just to watch him cut back my rose bushes. Whack, whack, whack. By the time he was finished, my rose bushes were only little stubs. Professional pruners will tell that most people are too timid when it comes to pruning. I used to think that pruning was going in and gently cleaning off the little dead pieces. Not so. The live stuff needs to go to branches, leaves, and flowers. Evidently, my neighbor knew what he was doing because my roses have never bloomed so beautifully. God uses his word as the pruning knife. We see this in verse 3. But he uses affliction to prepare people for the pruning of the word. One of the best ways to cleanse us is to allow suffering and problems to come into our lives. So this can take many forms, such as sickness, hardships, loss of material possessions. It could be persecution or slander, the loss of a loved one or grief in a relationship. In the book I just mentioned, Rick Warren describes, uh, puts these into three different categories, saying that God uses problems, pressures, and people. Whatever method of pruning God uses, we can be assured that he cares about us and he wants us to bear much fruit. In fact, our Heavenly Father is never closer to us than when he is pruning us. Knowing the Father's love and concern should change the way we look at trials. He does not allow us to experience problems and struggles for no purpose. We have to remember that the loppers are in the hands of our loving God. He knows what he's doing and he wants the best for us. I don't know about you, but I don't always look at trials and problems as pruning done by my loving father. More often, I lapse into self-pity, fear, complaining. I want to be more fruitful, but then I fight against or complain about the pruning process. Can any of you relate? I know studying these passages has been very beneficial to me. If we look at Hebrews 12, 7 and 10, we see this pruning mentioned. The end of verse 10 says, He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. The pruning process hurts, but the fruit, the holiness, is well worth it. So, speaking of fruit, that's our final element of this study. One thing I read about as I was uh, studying John 15 is that fruit is not the results. A machine or a robot gets results, but a living organism produces fruit. Several different kinds of spiritual fruit are mentioned in the Bible, and I'm going to mention these and then just share a Bible passage with you that um, goes along with that. 
So one of those is winning others to Christ, right? We're sharing our faith. We're bringing others into a saving faith relationship with Jesus. Uh, we can see this in Romans 1, 13. Being a part of the harvest, John 4, 35 through 38. Growing in holiness and obedience, Romans 6, 22. Christian giving, Romans 15, 28. Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Our good works and our service, Colossians 1, 10. The praise that comes from our heart and lips, Hebrews 13, 15. Something to think about here. Branches don't eat the fruit. Others do. In the same way, we are not producing fruit to please and benefit ourselves. We produce fruit to glorify God and serve others. We should be the kind of people who feed others by our words and our works. Spirit-produced fruit will go on reproducing from one life to another. There will be fruit, more fruit, much fruit. To close out, I wanna share from an article I came across that gave some ideas of things to do to remain in Jesus. We know that this is the most important. Jesus obviously believed we could do this too, or he never would have asked us to. So here were some suggestions, really practical suggestions that they gave that I wanna share with you. The first one, inventory. Before you go to bed each night, take a brief inventory of the day. Ask yourself, where did I remain today? If we are not remaining or abiding in Jesus, we are remaining somewhere else. I mean, that could be in anxiety, in fear, in anger, in maybe just numbness or self-absorption. Talk to Jesus about your desire to remain more in him. The second one is listening. Remaining happens when we have conversations with Jesus. Start each morning by having a conversation with him about a Bible verse that you read or maybe just about your day ahead. Um, then be still for a few moments. Ask Jesus, what do you want to say to me? Jesus is always trying to speak to us, but most often we don't take the time to listen. The third one is gratitude. One of the surest ways that we can learn to abide in Jesus is to practice gratitude. Take time regularly to give thanks to him. And there are so many different um, tools and suggestions out there to help you do this better. The last one is stillness. Try to sit in silence for five to 10 minutes each day. As thoughts come up, let them go. Be still. Over time, you will begin to notice more of his presence already alive in you. I've been trying this while I've been driving this week, and it is tough, but I'm growing to appreciate it more. So this article that I mentioned finished with these words, and I'd like to share them with you as we close out as well. It said, remaining in Jesus is not just one of many things we are asked to do as Jesus followers. It is the one thing from which everything else proceeds. To miss this is to miss him, and to miss him is to miss it all. I hope you guys enjoy your study this week of John 15, and I will see you all later.